Uh, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. O Lord, grant us wisdom to recognize the treasures you have stored up for us in heaven, that we may never despair but always rejoice and be thankful for the riches of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Amen. 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 So, um, this is probably worth showing you, because, you know, when you get me, you get a lot of artwork, and uh, so this is, um, this is from Juan de Valdez Leal in 1672. I'll just kind of walk around. You'll have to take a quick glance at it instead of being able to see it. You, you see this? It's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> Krausum, as they say in German. Krausum. Yeah. You're going to explain it to us? I am going to explain it to you. First of all, uh, the, the title in Iktu Okoli, again, for those of us who grew up with the old hymnal, we remember that we used to have Latin names for Sundays. Yes. Right? Do you remember yes. that? Yep. A little bit. Like the first Sunday in, in uh, Lent was, anybody remember that? Invocavit. Yeah. Invocavit which where we get invocation. And it uh, usually was from the first few lines of the introit, you know, to call upon, right? We call it invocate, we call upon the name of the Lord in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, invocate it. Uh, anyways, the third Sunday of Lent was called Akuli, Akuli, eyes, my eyes. My eyes are ever on the Lord, my eyes. Anyways, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, that expression, in the twinkling of an eye, means, right? Isn't that what, that expression is used to what? In the Bible, in the twinkling of an eye. Anybody remember? Split Jesus returns. Yeah. Twinkling of an eye. Split second. Yeah, split, se split second, just like that. Twinkling of an eye. And you, I mean, I don't even know. Does anybody know how, how long does it take you for, for you to blink? It's less than a second, right? Got to be, yeah. right? That's all fast. Boom. One second, and then boom. Um, so uh, if, if you had a chance to look at the, uh, the uh, uh, painting as, as I am, there's, a, there's a, a skeleton, right? And he's holding a coffin. And in front of him are all sorts of papers. And, you know, he's even got a foot, uh, his left foot is on a globe, he's, and all of these sort of riches thing, and in the twinkling of an eye, it was all gone, gone. right? And uh, therein lies what is, I think, the harsh reality of life, is our life could end in a twinkling of an eye. All you have to be is on the freeway, boom. Somebody makes a mistake, you make a mistake, twinkling of an eye, boom. It'd be nice to think we, everything was within our control and we can control our destinies and all that sort of stuff, but the reality is not. Why is this up here? Um, because it plays into the parable for, for this day, because I'm the parable guy. <laughs> Luke 12, 13 to 21. And, and since uh, we have our Bibles in front of us and we don't uh, have this up on the screen, maybe I'll ask the volunteer to read it. Luke 12, 13 to 21. Any volunteers? Thank you. As soon as I find you. Uh, that's the word. Uh, it's Matthew, Mark, Mark Luke, Luke, Luke <laughs> uh, 12, 13 to 21. Well. Okay. Whenever you're ready. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, 
Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, that's an uplifting uh, parable. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, there's a number of things uh, where it's kind of just uh, out of the gate we're talking about, and that is um, what is uh, what exactly is covetousness? How would you describe that? Wanting. Wanting. Wanting? Okay. More. Wanting more? <laughs> Wanting what belongs to someone else. Good God. <laughs> Selfishly. Selfishly. Uh, there's a commandment about this, right? Uh, you shouldn't, yeah. Right? <laughs> there's two of them, nine and ten, right? Uh, covet, would you say coveting is you have this strong desire to want what is somebody else's? Right. Yeah, right? Yeah. Selfishly. Um, is, is this kind of fair to say this, that advertising, particularly like on TV and stuff like that, is a exercise in working up coveting in us, right? It's in, pro, is it promoting covetousness? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm asking the question, is it, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I see is, you know, I'm not too sure I would ever necessarily want what I see, but after I see it, um, I say to myself, yeah. And then when I see it, uh, somebody else has it, yeah. So uh, covetousness um, uh, is very interesting because, right, we already know that in the circumstance of the parable that this is within the mind of the people of Israel, remember, they're, they're under the commandments, right? They know the law, and they don't know the law about uh, the dangers of covetousness. Um, what is uh, also, uh, uh, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Does that sound familiar? Carefree. Carefree. Does uh, Epicureanism ring a bell to, to anybody, right? This was a kind of a philosophy that um, life is essentially about pleasure, and so therefore you, you kind of gear everything towards that, right? <laughs> and so uh, the idea is all your strivings in life kind of work towards that, right? Uh, um, I don't know if, if, if it's necessarily true. Is, is our culture hedonistic that way? Our own culture? Are we, are we primarily pleasure seekers? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, everything's about fun. Everything has to be fun. Everything has to be a good time. Stuff like that. Well, our society is built on it. Yeah, yeah, you know, has, has it, it's, I, I guess it's worth kind of reflecting whether, it, has it always been that way? Yeah. No, no? Manifest destiny, the whole idea is we are, this land is my land, this land is my land. <laughs> yeah, please. The problem I see with advertising now, as opposed to, at least on television, as opposed to what it was when I was a child in the yeah. 50s, is that it, there, it's not just advertising a product, it's saying two things. <clears throat> you should have this, and you deserve it. You deserve it, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting, it's, uh, you know, 
I'm mindful of the fact that I think we would covet even without advertising, right? Because they didn't have advertising. It's not like, you know, Jesus walking along the road, right, from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem, all these billboards are up. Uh, yeah, no, you didn't have that. And coveting is still part of that. And, and you can covet a lot of things. This is kind of a tough, hmm, if you ever, like I used to teach confirmation class, you got junior high kids, and that's a tough gig, dude, right? Because what is it? Man, it is hard when you're not as fast or strong or smart or popular. It's, you know, the things that really, you know, this kind of this aspect of, of desire. And one of the difficult parts of life is where, you know, there's a place for us as well. You know, like I think even this whole body shaming thing, Right? It's, it's kind of connected to the fact that we want to say to people, you have to look a certain way. You have to be a certain kind of person, in other words. And, you know, we have to realize that the kids that we see in front of us, you know, we're, we might have an Einstein, but man, most of us are going to be just kind of ordinary. Life's okay to be ordinary, right? Jesus loves you if you're ordinary. He's not going to hate you if you're ordinary. If you can't return 110 mile surf, Jesus still loves you. If you can't hit a 110 mile serve, Jesus still loves you. You won't be able to win, but you can still do it. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, covetousness started in the garden. Oh, yes. That's a very good point, by the way, right? Uh, this whole idea, isn't it? The temptation is you can. Yeah, and this is something to be desired, right? And, uh, th yeah, I've often kind of thought about that, right? Satan brings into the garden already the agenda. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good point. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's move on here. Um, I have these notes in front of my... Uh, most people go through life with a series of goals in mind. Maybe they have consciously adopted their goals. Perhaps their goals have never been spoken. Goals give us direction, and guidance. If we meet them, we might consider ourselves successful. Uh, if we accomplish a worthwhile task, we feel like success. But what is success? Because doesn't this parable kind of operate on the premise that the rich fool is a fool? Yeah, yeah he's a fool, but he's a success, right? I mean, uh, in Indiana, where I, I served as pastor, you, uh, the farmer who built bigger barns is a guy who's doing well. He's doing well, right? I mean, I had guys in Indiana who farm thousands of acres. And this is good soil. Not as good as Illinois, where I come from. But it's still good soil. And uh, uh, so these are the guys you kind of look at this is, this is, this guy is a success. And uh, by the way, this is also something that's part of the fabric of our, of our culture. Is we like winners, right? Nobody remembers, right? Um, you follow basketball? Yeah. Yeah? Do you remember who won NCAA men's basketball last year? Who won the tournament? I don't follow that close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. Don't let him pick your butts. Uh, was UConn, right? UConn. Oh, yeah. But, you know, uh, there are 64 teams who remembers most of them, right? No, nobody. But the winners, who won, who won the Super Bowl this year? Not the Chiefs. 49ers, because they got robbed. Who won? <laughs> no, Chiefs won. They won for a spare. Um, and uh, baseball, how about World Series? Who won World Series last year? Rangers, right? Rangers, very good. So in other words, uh, it invites, uh, we, are, we are a culture of, of success, and maybe most cultures are success, right? Uh, but the, the question is, is sort of what, what, what is success? Uh, I have by, uh, this um, guy by the name of uh, H. Jackson Brown, and he has 21 suggestions for success. See how this, this uh, 
what you think about this. Marry the right person. This one, this one decision will determine 90% of your happiness or misery. <laughs> you have to ask Jean how she feels about that. <laughs> Work at something you enjoy and that's worthy of your time and talent. Give people more than they expect and do it cheerfully. Become the most positive and enthusiastic person you know. Be forgiving of yourself and others. Be generous. Have a grateful heart. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Discipline yourself to save money on even the most modest salary. Treat everyone you meet like you want to be treated. <coughs> Commit yourself to constant improvement. Commit yourself to, a, to quality. Understand that happiness is not based on possessions, power, or prestige, but on relationships with people you love and, and respect. That is certainly an interesting one, right? Be loyal, be honest, be a self-starter, and so on and so forth. Uh, then I have uh, this, this thing. Uh, this, uh, this used to be a poster, success. When you're standing and he's not. <laughs> That's pretty good. Huh? And then I, of course, have the next slide is the crucifixion. And is this an image of success? Yes and no. Okay, uh, you want to explain that? <clears throat> yes. Why yes and why no? Yes, because that's why Jesus came into the world. Yeah, to lay down his life down, right? But <clears throat> then why no? Because uh, he was crucified <clears throat> as a criminal. Yes, yeah. The, you know, I have had people in my ministry come up to me and say, you know, if I could have just been there. If I could have just been there. I would have, I would have. But the reality is, if you would have been there, you would have gone, whew, this doesn't look so good. Because... You can't do it anything anyway. Yeah, but you know, G Jesus looks like the ultimate loser. You talk about the scene itself. People are cheering your death by. They're having a good time, you know? It's like... You know, hot dogs, hot dogs, you know, there, yeah, there he goes, you know. Uh, is this is like sport to them. And they, the people who were there, talking about in light of the sermon this morning, what did people see? What they think they see is, here is this troublemaker getting his, his just desserts. Doesn't look like success. And, and that's why, you know, this is part of the reversal of fortune theme in the New Testament. On the one hand, it, do, it, it does not, it's not what it looks like. It's, there's a reversal of fortune. All right. So someone in the crowd says to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And of course, Jesus says, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Um, uh, so what did this person in the crowd want? You remember? More. Yeah. Well, he, he specifically says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, this sets another parable up, the prodigal son, right? Because the prodigal son, three chapters later, is going to have this same sort of thing. How many of you have been personally involved in inheritances and stuff like that? What? Uh, been involved in inheritances, right? What, what you know... Um, all I know, uh, this is what I can tell you. Uh, inheritances are very tricky things, right? Uh, this is almost when the worst dynamic of family relationships surface. Where people, what does people want? I mean, people want mom's necklace. People want the ring. They want the car. That's what I they, wanted. What? They want, you know, it's very... You know, this is, uh, and this is why when we hear this, we get a sense of this is very much sort of in play. What happens when the last parent dies and now everything has to be divided up? Now, just a minute. First of all, notice Jesus' reaction is very sharp. Who made me or a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, what you might not have a sense of is, 
that in Israel at this time, rabbis, in fact, did this kind of job, right? Second parent died, so what do you do? You go over, do you have brothers, sisters? Yes. How many? One of each. One of each, so it's three of you. So, you know, you go to your local Missouri Synod pastor. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. no. Uh, and then you kind of go, hey, uh, well, how, how is this going to get divided? Right? Now, one of the things that we know, if I have enough time, well, I'll read it, is we know from the book of Deuteronomy, who gets more? It was not evenly divided, right? It wasn't you get a third, your brother gets a sister gets a third. How was it divided? Firstborn. The firstborn gets twice as much as everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so rabbis were expected to do this. Now, a lot of times in inheritance issues, it can be a, a real question. Does the 59, is the 59 Chevy worth $100,000 or is it? junk and it's $500, right? So you need to have somebody impartial who goes, just give it to me and we'll call it a day. My, my mother drove a 59 Chevy with the, with the fins, if you remember. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, that, was, that was beautiful back in those days. They were wings, not fins. They were wings, yeah. You, really, if you go fast enough, you could just lift off. So, um, rabbis were supposed to sort of do this, but just kind of go, and, and I think there's a bigger message in this is, is this what we're looking to Jesus for? <laughs> Law-related stuff, right? Is this why G Jesus came into the world to settle all disputes and all art? No, he did, in fact, not. And so he bristles at the mere suggestion that he should get involved kind of in this. Um, and then in, in answer to the question, he warns us about covetousness. Now, do we need that warning about covetousness? Do we need something like that? Yes. We absolutely do. Yeah, right? And so, um, uh, so let's go on. Um, and, and see, there's even this... Uh, from Deuteronomy 21. Let me read this section to you from Deuteronomy 21. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, that's hard, right? Yeah. And both the loved and the unloved one have borne him children. If the firstborn <laughs> son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. I mean, first of all, you have this whole question of polygamy, right, which is... You know, but then this whole idea, there's the loved and the unloved, and that somehow that the children of the unloved would get shafted, right? Where you kind of go, oh man, come on. <laughs> In the fact that even the, the Mosaic law has to spell this out about you cannot treat children deferentially uh, this, this way. This is the sort of stuff that, that, that rabbis kind of got involved with. So from there, Jesus pivots, as he often does, like in Luke 15, when we get to uh, the three parables that are there, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, it, it is occasioned by the fact that Jesus ate with sinners. Ate with sinners. And then he pivots to those three. Here he pivots in this parable, from this circumstance, to the land of the rich man, right? Who thinks to himself, what am I going to do I've got nowhere to store my, my crops. Now this is the sort of thing where you want to say, this is a kind of a good problem to have, right? This is a great problem to have. He's going to tear down his barns, build larger ones, store all the grain, say, hey, eat, relax, eat, drink, and, merit, uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. At this point, do we say to ourselves, this is a successful person? 
Is this a successful person? Yes. It sure sounds like that, doesn't it? Right? Um, because he, he, he's done something with his life, right? He, he's, he's a winner. He's, just, he, he's, he's right? And so he's reached a level of success. The only thing he has, he has missed, and it's the biggest sort of thing of all, is what? What has he failed to see? God's blessing on him? Yes, and he, it was always all about him. him. Yeah. Isn't this the nature of covetousness? Mm -hmm. Selfishness? <laughs> is you simply see everything through the prism of your own life, your own accomplishments, your own stature. Instead of, he kind of comes across as being a person who had no regard for the things of God. Um, so I have these, I have a couple of these, it's too bad we can't see, I have this great painting by uh, Rembrandt. Uh, I'll just show you, uh, from here I'll just show you, you can have a sense of it at least, because one of the things, if you, if you know Rembrandt, you know he's the master of light. Yeah. Right? And you see that? Or you can look it up later if you're, you're thus inclined, The Rich Fool by Rembrandt is here you have this um, this old fella looks to be about my age and uh, he's all alone with all of the stacks of um, of ledgers right because everything has to be kept track of you remember when we used to do accounting mm -hmm. oh, my, my, remember? Oh, I'm two cents off <laughs> Yeah, I remember, boy, I've even gone to church meetings in which we've had all big arguments over 13 cents difference in the, you know, you got to kind of go, here, you need those 13 cents, I'll give you those 13 cents, let's just, you know, so this, I mean, the kingdom is not going to fall on 13 cents missing one place or another, please. Um, and he's, he's, and the other thing is, he's got this candlelight. And he is absolutely, totally alone. That's what this kind of... Because imagine the circumstances of the parable that Jesus tells. And the thing right before it is, when you have to go to war with one of your relatives, one of your brothers or sisters, over what your wanting for yourself as an inheritance, you can pretty much guarantee that this family is broken. broken, busted. And when you get to that point, you say, what is this all? What is this all worth? Is this really? You have a couple more centavos? That's, that's worth this kind of blowing everything up? Is it kind of better to say to yourself, maybe I'll take less just to keep everything intact right and then if people cheat you that's on them you have to kind of answer that in the end as well oh yeah i gotta show this too because some of you will uh recognize this this is from the old arch books you remember this oh yeah yeah hey the rich fool and, and you know what and the the people who illustrated this they were kind of clever because they made the man yeah, he was, uh, because only rich people in the ancient world could be bad, right? When we hear uh, that uh, Lazarus and the rich man, he fared sumptuously every day, remember that? Yeah, people, wow, because most people ate like maybe one good meal a day back, right? Very Spartan. Then he has this nice coat that he got at Macy's. <laughs> Nordstrom. Nordstrom, there you go. The Nordstrom. Uh, too long, too. Uh, we, have to, we have to skip over so many things. Then God said to him, and isn't this interesting, in this parable, um, Jesus throws in, and God said to him, God said to him, fool, <coughs> The Greek word is a word you actually know. It's more, which comes down to our English as? Death. 
more more no, no, not no. not more K, but more A. Like, how how would this have been as a translation? And God said to him, "Moron." <laughs> That's the word, moron. Moron. Wow. Um, in German, it really cuts. Du nar. You idiot. Now this is, you want preaching of the law, kiddos. This is preaching of the law. When God calls you an idiot, yeah, you can pretty much kind of go, yeah. <laughs> then he goes, <laughs> God said to him, moron, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Now this is always the case with inheritances, right? You know, we, you know, I, you know, what did we do a couple of years ago, Jean Beth? We did living well, mm -hmm. living well, advanced directives, all that sort of stuff. We did that because we don't trust our sons. I don't know how your parents feel about you guys, but I was not about to take a chance on my guys. Uh, he has his heart rate and everything is good. I just pulled the plug anyway. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's always kind of a, um, this consideration of and this is even in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, right, about what, what's going to happen to the things for which you have strived so hard. Maybe your, maybe your kids will treasure it, or maybe they will just right. blow it. You can't take it with you. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and so he's, he's kind of painted as a guy who really thought he had like a really strong, what's that great scene from uh, Meet the Parents, right? Your portfolio is a strong, I would say strong to very strong. This is a guy whose portfolio was really strong. And he was thinking, you know what? I'm going to be able to kick it for a long time. Go to French Open, swatch, uh, you know. Have you played it on, on clay? Have you ever done that? I did that once in my life in Indianapolis. <laughs> Um, with uh, Mike Fitzgerald. Do you know Mike at all? No, he's uh, up in Pacifica, or over, it's actually where uh, Pastor Fro is. Now, he was a delegate to the convention, we found clay courts, and we, that's a whole, that's a whole different deal, right? Uh, but anyway, um, so he thought he had this great portfolio, he's going to be able to live great for a long time, and then in the twinkling, twinkling of an eye. So, you know, there is this kind of sense that, you know, uh, you know, Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, he talks about, you know, we should take no thought for the morrow, consider the lilies of the field, another great movie, Sidney Poitier, uh, or, uh, uh, the birds of the, right, they, they neither spin nor toll, but yet your heavenly Father, right, cares for them. Uh, this doesn't mean that financial planning is bad by no means. It doesn't mean that um, uh, having a good plan in place is bad. But it's all encapsulated, in, it so often is with Jesus' parables, in the last line. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Because if you're rich toward God, for example, <clears throat> would, would this encounter between uh, this person who wants Jesus to be an arbitrator or judge, if you're rich towards God, is this really how you interact with other people? So, uh, in the end, was this man rich or poor? Very poor. <laughs> was he rich or poor? Yes, poor? He was poor. He was poor. 
Yes. <clears throat> and to the extent, again, that this is wisdom literature, it, it invites us to examine our own lives in light of this. How are we rich towards God? How, how, how does a parable like this see our own lives <coughs> in a different light? Um, the dangers, because covetousness is always a danger. It always lurks, right? It lurks at the door. And there's always this kind of concern that we can get swept away, right, by it. Uh, let's see. Ah, there's some Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Eric Clapton. Uh, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? It, isn't it interesting? It's not where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But it's where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We hear this reading, by the way, on Ash Wednesday. So the question is, how does God measure success? So if I, if I, if I were to ask you, as, and we have some variation in ages among us. You guys are kind of on the younger side of the scale. A lot of gray hair, maybe more towards the middle. Um, so for us, we're kind of heading towards the bunny slope uh, on the way into the lodge. Uh, they're still going up the, uh, up the lift. Um, so how, how do we measure in our rear view mirror our lives? And how do, what do we say to these young guys here on the younger side of, of how, how you live your life in terms of, because <clears throat> What do you want at the end? I mean, do you want, do you want God to call you? What God to call you a moron at the end? Uh, no, right. So how do we lead lead lead, lead our lives? Hmm? I had a thought. The pictures that you showed with the light on the pictures. Mm -hmm. I think that's how our relationship um, to God. Um, the other C is that the, how we are is that the light is not shining on us because we didn't do it. Yeah. The light is shining on God and what He has done for His people. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. You know, I no, I think. Um, what What do you want? Too much is given, much will be expected. Expect, right. So. I think that a lot of times in life is, and, and this is the idea of even of um, stewardship. We're all kind of stewards of our of our of our lives, right? So, in the stewardship of your life, to what extent do you say to yourself, you know, you know what I really cared about in my life? I cared about myself. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's when and you end up hearing stuff from God about. Uh, but it's, it's really kind of an in, encompassing kind of view about your life, not just the stuff that you have or own or possess or will be able to leave behind for your inheritors. It's actually kind of in the bump and grind, you know, is, is, it, is it good to find time to play tennis? Sure it is. Mm -hmm. Sure it is, right? Um, is it good to play golf? Not when uh, you play golf like I do. <laughs> what? No. Um, Depends. Uh, but um, it's also good to find time to pray, read scripture, do devotions, right? Go to church. <laughs> well, I think the optimum word that we have in all of this is love. Mm. Sure. And God's great love for us and what he's given us. And if we reflect that love, I mean, can you imagine what this world would be like? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I think this is, um, certainly this should be seen in this light, right? To the extent that we're all sinners, we all kind of go, yeah, yeah, I come short of the glory of God, right? But at the same time, again, see, seeing this, 
<clears throat> because the second commandment is like unto the first, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If he would have thought that, would he really have gone to Jesus and said, show me the money? <laughs> and, and therein lies, I mean, people's value systems are sometimes really whacked. And we have to kind of say, and this is where you have to disentangle yourself from the world, right? It's a... Uh, no más bueno. Well, the real owner of everything is God yeah. because he created everything. Sure. This is why, I, again, you know, uh, when I receive the offerings at Holy Cross, I always turn and I always say the same thing that I did when I was young. We give thee but thine own. Yeah. Whatever the gift may be, all that we have is yours alone. Not yours alone. Yeah. A trust. Can, a trust, dear Lord, from thee. And I can prove it from the Old Testament because Abraham heard God tell him, I'm giving you this land. Sure. Which means he owned it. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and on the flip side of this, in terms of redemption, you are bought with a price. You're bought with a price. So, that means, if he bought you, guess what? He owns you. you. <clears throat> and this is the, the, the whole idea of even, uh, you know, baptism in about 15 minutes. Uh, in the baptismal uh, liturgy, receive the sign of the cross on your forehead and on your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. In the Bible, a mark is a sign of ownership. Ownership. So it's like cattle. You're branded. And with that comes also protection. I once had a young person come see me and said, they were reading the Bible, which is always, she said, reading the Bible, way to go. Say, so, oh man, I can't believe. Mm. Cain is afraid, and then, then God put a, remember the mark on Cain? Yeah. And he was all up in arms about that. Oh, what, this is like, it's like sort of like uh, what's that, that novel with the A? Scarlet Letter, right? No, oh, he's like the Scarlet. Oh, I can't believe that. Uh. I said, no, 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 dude. Come on, man. Pay attention. Pay attention. No, uh, this was Mike Mellick, by the way, way back in the day. And I said, no, nah, dude, man. He put the mark on Cain to say, I'm going to protect you. You see the sign of the cross on your forehead. You have been marked. That's why in the book of Revelation, right, everybody knows the sign of the beast, right? Oh, the sign of the beast. Six, six, six. But the redeemed have the mark, mark. of the name of Jesus. That's why we remember our baptism that way. All right, guys. Well, we did about as well as we could under all the circumstances of, you know, uh, getting ready and all that sort of stuff. So let's, uh, shall we close with the Lord's Prayer? Yes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, Lord's blessings to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.